You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 92. And today we have a special guest, Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. And I'm going to introduce Jonathan in just a second. But I just wanted to say thank you to those of you who have listened, who have downloaded. We are surpassing 280,000 downloads in about a year and a half since starting the podcast in January of 2019. We've had such a good uh, response from both parents and professionals. So if there's someone out there that's in the autism world that doesn't know about my podcast, I'd love it if you would share marybarbera.com forward slash podcast. If you would tell them about the podcast, um, leave a rating and review wherever you are listening at Apple Podcasts or Pandora or iHeartRadio, wherever you're listening. I would love it if you would leave me a rating and review and um, tell others to also search. Um, and one of the really great benefits for me of um, starting the podcast is to meet people like John, Dr. Jonathan Tarbucks, who I had never met before and, and just, you know, um, really learning myself about uh, ACT, which is a treatment package. So today we are talking mostly about ACT, acceptance and commitment training or therapy. Uh, we're going to talk about the parts of it, what it actually is, and how it can serve both parents and professionals as well as kids with higher language abilities than, you know, if you're, if you have a child that's newly diagnosed or, or nonverbal at this point, um, um, the treatment package is going to be mostly for parents and professionals. So today we're talking specifically about how to help parents uh, using the, the techniques within the ACT approach. So Dr. Jonathan Tarbox is the founder and program director of the Master of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis program at the University of Southern California. And he's also the director of research at First Steps for Kids. He is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Behavior Analysis and Practice, and his research focuses on behavioral interventions and teaching complex skills to individuals with autism and without autism using acceptance and commitment training. So all of the show notes, um, the show notes are going to include all of the resources that Dr. Tarbucks talks about. That'll be at marybarbera.com forward slash 92. I hope you enjoy this special interview with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. So thank you, Jonathan, for spending some time with us. I, it's great to meet you uh, kind of in person, at least over video and uh, to get to know you better. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's really a privilege and an honor. I appreciate it. Excellent. So I know we're going to jump in and talk about a big research interest of yours being ACT, um, uh, acceptance and commitment training or therapy. So before we get to that, I always like to start and describe your fall into the autism world. <laughs> fall. I like that. I've never heard that before. Uh, yeah. So I was a political science major studying uh, nonviolent uh, uh, community action and nonviolent, uh, compassionate community building. And uh, I uh, stumbled on a job ad for a tutor for a kid with autism. Uh, I was going to a little liberal arts school in the mountains in Vermont called Marlboro College. And uh, I went and checked out this job and turned out it was an ABA program, uh, a home-based ABA program. There were no BCBAs up there at the time. Uh, this was in 97, I think, or 98. Um, no, there, there was no such thing as a BCBA well, in 1997. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so um, it was a mom putting together the best program she could for her kid in their cute little farmhouse in the mountains in Vermont. Um, and so she had bought like VHS cassettes on how to do ABA. And we sat in her living room and watched the you know, cassettes and tried to imitate what the trainers were doing and stuff and um, cobbled together this program for her kid who uh, her kid was super cute kid, like bright orange hair, cute freckles and everything, severe challenging behavior. He, he didn't make it easy on us and we were doing our best, you know? Um, and looking back now, like we did a terrible job, but you know, but even with that, just the basics, you know, like being present, showing up, prompting reinforcement, prompt fading, all that. Um, the kid was making progress and like, I got hooked immediately because there was like the science to it and also the, 
the piece where you can actually help people and not just kind of try hard and do your best, but actually be accountable for, is it working? And if it isn't working, let's tweak it, you know, and you can see the behaviors going up on the graph and it was so satisfying. Um, and mostly just like the mom's commitment was the main thing that hooked me was um, that I, you know, she was there for her kid hundred percent and that she was all in, you know, and, uh, and then us, me and the other college students, including my wife at the time, um, were like just fully engaged and just um, doing something hard and scary, but like meaningful, more meaningful than anything I had done previously. So, um, so I was hooked, and uh, then I got a yeah, job. Yeah, it's so funny. It's so funny because I'd say out of the professionals who are not parents of kids with autism, other professionals almost I. I should go back and actually review, but it's a very similar story with a lot of falls into the autism world is they responded to an ad in college to work with a child with autism with a super gung ho mom at the mm-hmm. wheel. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's really nice to hear um, as a parent myself, that's how I fell into the autism world, but to hear the professional journeys of are very similar in a lot of ways. So go ahead. Well, so, so then after you were hooked, then what you do? <laughs> well, and no, and I did, you know, and I wanted to say like, I often think, and I think it's true that most of us in the field of ABA owe our careers to moms, to autism moms. Like that's why our jobs exist because of the blood, sweat, and tears of thousands and thousands of autism moms. And some dads too, they're doing their part too sometimes, but really, it, you know, it's the moms that are right there in the A trenches, lot of the times. Making it happen a lot of times. Um, and yeah, in fact, so- I, I wrote, I wrote a, um, a paper when I was getting my PhD, I wrote a paper and discovered in the foreword of uh, an ethical book, I think, or, or how to think like a behavior analyst book. Mm. Um, in the foreword of that, one of those books, it was stated that the entire B- BACB, the entire credentialing board of behavior analysts are uh, owe it to Let Me Hear Your Voice, which is a book that was published in 1993, which mom obviously had as her Bible, as I did, to start that program without. So the, the demand of that book, the demand that that book created for people that knew what they were doing. Uh, so like the whole BCBA movement was, was started with a parent's uh, account. So yeah, I mean, I'm glad we touched on that a little bit. So go ahead. So we were interested in how then you got yes. farther. So, yeah. So then I, uh, I got my first sort of like real ABA job at the New England Center for Children, which was amazing. Learned like the highest quality skill acquisition programming there. Um, And then worked at Kennedy Krieger Institute, learned uh, uh, functional analysis and treatment of really severe behavior, um, and really how to do research and produce data that are publishable. Um, And then super lucky to get into the uh, University of Nevada, Reno in the PhD program and study with Linda Hayes and Steve Hayes and Larry Williams and Michelle Wallace and folks there, Pat Gezzi, Ramona Humanfar, and uh, and really learn about the philosophy that, that forms the foundation and really the, uh, the difficult uh, conceptual pieces that really form the foundation of our science um, and also allow us to extend our science into more complex human behavior um, as opposed to relatively simple functional communication and challenging behavior, things like that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then that was, I ju- it kind of just took off from there. So that's, and, and now at, you know, I was at CARD for 10 years as the research director. Now I'm at First Steps as the research director, and I founded and am the director of a master's uh, in ABA program at the University of Southern California. Um, and that's my gig now. And then I've got a million other, uh, you know, side hustles that are <laughs> killing me, like, you know, editing books and things like that. And um, editor in chief of the journal Behavior Analysis and Practice, which is sort of the premier uh, practitioner's journal in ABA. Um, and that term is coming to an end. Thank goodness. It's been one of the coolest jobs I've ever had, but just it's too much. So I'm going to be finishing that up this uh, around New Year's uh, 2021. And uh, yeah, so that's what I do. And how often is that journal published? Four times a year. Oh, okay. And is it all electronic? Yeah, you you can get You can still subscribe to paper copies, I believe. I don't know that anyone does, (laughs) but yeah, yeah. And uh, most people access it um, online, yeah. Okay, great. So um, I'm assuming when you were at University of Nevada with the Hayes, uh, Hayes's, I guess that's how you say it, Steve Hayes mm-hmm. and Linda Hayes, uh, is when you got involved with the whole ACT uh, yeah. 
is that a philosophy or what is ACT? What does it stand for? Let's just start yeah. there. All right, let's start there. So ACT stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, or when practiced in ABA and other sort of non-psychotherapeutic disciplines, for example, like physical therapists use it a lot, um, life coaches, uh, coaches, a- athletic coaches use it in, in settings that don't involve psychotherapy for psychological disorders. Um, it's called training, and it's a little bit different. We can talk about the difference, but... Um, but basically ACT is a way to uh, learn new habits of dealing with our own uh, internal. Uh, so I'm mostly going to toss out the behavioral jargon and just talk like a normal human. And there'll be a few crusty old behavior analysts, you know, apoplectic, you know, listening to your podcast, uh, but they'll, they'll survive. But um, basically <laughs> it's a way of learning new habits of responding to our own thoughts, emotions, and bodily sensations when those are difficult, when those are challenging or aversive in behavioral jargon. Um, And so it turns out that most of the ways, most of the habits that we've learned in the society have taught us about how to respond to difficulty or adversity usually actually makes stuff worse and usually pushes us towards avoidance, like unwillingness to fully experience the difficulty in life. And uh, that's fine when it doesn't matter, but turns out the more time we spend avoiding and just trying to feel good rather than really fully feeling what's going on, uh, the more it moves us away from stuff that we really care about. And so <clears throat> our lives can become smaller and smaller around the things that we care about the most. And so we have parents of, of kids with autism who feel imprisoned in their own homes. And we have uh, BCBAs who feel completely uh, constricted and destroyed by their own stress and burnout on the job. And we have, uh, just everyday humans, you know, all of us who feel powerless to do things like change our diet, to, to eat something healthier, eat more plants or whatever you care about with healthy food or get outside and get some exercise. Um, a lot of those challenges come down to how we respond to our own thoughts and feelings. And so ACT is about just, it's a skills training procedure to just train a bunch of really healthy habits that help us identify what we really care about, choose small uh, doable goals, and set goals and just get moving and choose behaviors that move us towards what we really care about in small but meaningful ways. So uh, as I'm listening, and I know pretty uh, not very much about ACT, so it's it's good for me to learn with uh, anybody out there that's listening that that doesn't know a lot either about this subject. But it sounds like, you know, what can happen if you aren't, you know, tackling or becoming resilient and feel, you know, making lemonade out of lemons and Mm -hmm. so forth is, is that you can be addicted to uh, substances or um, things. So it sounds like it could, it could be really powerful within the addiction world too. It is. Yeah. So ACT was originally developed for, um, for behavior analytic psychotherapists to address sort of typical problems of, you know, of psychology, for example, anxiety, depression, substance abuse disorders, uh, chronic pain, things like that. And there's, you know, I think 200 or 300 randomized control trials now published in scientific journals showing that it works for those traditional Mm. challenges of psychopathology. Um, And yeah, super effective for those. Um, But the neat thing about it is the model behind ACT, which by the way, is the same model behind all of ABA, is the assumption that nobody's broken. There is no thing inside you that's broken. There is no cause inside you that's deep, dark, scary, and broken, and that we need to fix. The assumption is we're all perfectly human humans. And the choices that we make on a day-to-day basis greatly impact the quality of our lives. Um, And so a lot of the sort of um, functional problems, if you're thinking about behavioral repertoires that are are, uh, problematic at the heart of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, a lot of those same basic functional issues are the same for anybody who doesn't have the label for their, for their behavior, but still just has a hard time making behavior changes that really matter. And a lot of what it comes down to is avoidance, avoidance of wanting to feel sad, avoidance of wanting to feel scared, avoidance of wanting to feel angry, avoidance of uh, uh, wanting to contact thoughts like I'm not good enough. I'm a bad mom. I'm a bad dad. I'm too tired. Whatever, whatever the thoughts are that get in the way when you try to, do something that matters to you, the unwillingness to sit with those thoughts and experience those thoughts and the unwillingness to experience the emotions that come along with them, all of the behaviors that we build up that are escape maintained basically, 
So eating too much, drinking too much, sleeping too much, too much, you know, too much YouTube, too much Instagram, whatever, right? Um, all of that, if it gets in the way of, of us actually doing stuff that matters deeply in our hearts on a day-to-day -day basis, all of those can be problematic. And so ACT is about building new habits for sort of tweaking those and, and creating flexibility around those. Cool. Oh, and I'm sure that the research on happiness also comes into play here. And mm -hmm. um, one of my goals is for every child, whether they have autism or not, and every adult to be as safe as possible, as independent as possible, and as happy as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, the whole happiness, mindfulness, mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. coaching, uh, therapy kind of things, all, it sounds like it's rolled in. So this was, uh, is, is this like a methodology, an approach, a tool? Mm -hmm. Like what exactly is ACT? It's a treatment package. So it's a treatment okay. package just in the same way that something like functional communication training is a treatment package. So functional communication training uh, consists of identifying the function of some behavioral excess and placing it on extinction as much as possible and then teaching some other alternative behaviors that will then resort in, uh, result in that same uh, functional reinforcer, right? So in other words, teaching people ways to get what they want <laughs> through behaviors that are more adaptive and more successful in their daily lives, rather than having to engage in behaviors that could be destructive to get what they want and what they need. Um, ACT is the same thing. It's just a lot more complex treatment package. There's six uh, sort of overarching general um, skill repertoires that we're trying to train. Whereas in maybe something like, you know, FCT, there's kind of really just two sort of topographies and they all have the same function, you know, but it's the same idea. We've got sort of behavioral repertoires that we want to train. Um, and we could talk about some of the most important ones out of those six, if you like, or, or how do you want to attack? Okay. So do we use the ACT treatment for parents, for professionals, for kids with autism? Like what is most common or, sure. you know, it might help us if we like come up with a, a person that we're going to sure. help sure. and then we apply the principles. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. So the answer to that is act can work for anyone whose language and thoughts are getting in the way of them being the most successful in whatever setting that, that matters in their life. And so have you ever met a child with autism whose language and thoughts are getting in the way of being successful? Absolutely, right? Have you ever met a mom or a dad, right? Absolutely. How about a BCBA or an RBT? Of course, right? So um, okay. the way that it works, though, is through creating flexibility around verbal behavior. So if a child just doesn't even have enough verbal behavior yet to be inflexible about it, then probably they're not quite ready, right? Um, but as soon as they're able to start describing themselves, describing others, saying things, saying how things should be or have to be or could have, should have, would have, any of that stuff, any responding to the past or the future or the, sorry, the, yeah, the past or the future in ways that are rigid and get in the way, any of that, doesn't matter if you have autism, don't have autism, what diagnosis you have, if your language is, in the, is getting in the way, uh, then ACT can, is likely to be helpful. So if you want, we can imagine like a particular kid okay. or a particular parent or something. I actually would like to, let's focus on a parent who just got a diagnosis of autism because yeah. most of the kids I help, you know, my first book, The Verbal Behavior Approach, my new book that's coming out in the spring, Turn Autism Around, are really for kids who are not conversational. Mm -hmm. So they probably just don't, have enough language for us to really apply it. But we, I work with a ton of parents and I think it would really help the professionals too, to help that new parent with a new diagnosis of autism, who's stressed out, overwhelmed, you know, is reading all this stuff on the internet, doesn't know what to do, who to trust, you know, might be having some marital conflicts because of this diagnosis yeah. may have to quit her job or decide on daycare. And there's just a lot of, you know, that has siblings. So why don't we kind of go through the six things that we're trying to teach sure. this mom of this newly diagnosed. I think that would might be more, most helpful. Yeah, it sounds good. And first uh, I just want to say, I really empathize with folks that are sitting in that uh, situation right now. Um, it's really tough for parents at under any circumstances. And I can only imagine right now, under the COVID circumstances, being stuck at home, having limited access to services and all of that, um, how stressful uh, that's gotta be. It's just a whole other level. We don't even, we have no idea. We're like, we have never experienced this before. Um, so parents who are doing that are, you know, they're the- kids. Well, exciting. I just wanna jump in here and not to, 
um, we, we've had several parents actually within my online courses and community um, when I've said like, what are you struggling with, with COVID? And they, they, a few of them have said like COVID is actually a blessing for us because we have taken you. your online course. We've learned the, str- we've learned what to do and we've seen amazing progress. And one of the women that's seen amazing progress um, is featured on podcast episode number 78. So marybarbera.com forward slash 78 is a mom with a new diagnosis right before COVID. The COVID shut down, took my course one month, went from two words to 180 words awesome. and phrases awesome. and just all That's kind cool. of progress. And, and, and so it's, it's possible. It, it, and that's not to diminish anybody because most of the parents of children with new diagnosis are, are just not in the same shape as this uh, Michelle who's featured on that podcast. But so I do think that focusing on that, but it's, it is a totally uh, different situation because of COVID because services are shut down. They're virtual. The, you know, if you're used to your child going to a clinic, they may not be able to go or they may have to wear a mask and they're not wearing a mask. And that's all like a part of it now, which makes it super, super stressful. But um, okay. So back to our mom with a new diagnosis um, of a two or three year old. Okay. So the first thing I'd say is all of us have learned patterns that aren't helpful. And so act part, part of act is just noticing our own behavior, bringing attention to our own behavior and our own uh, thoughts and our own emotions and our own physical sensations. And so they talk about that as present moment awareness training or mindfulness. And basically it's just the habit of uh, practicing, noticing what's going on and practicing, noticing what's going on without judgment. And so Uh, whatever task you're engaged in, uh, we notice as humans, our minds will wander and start thinking about something else. And so maybe the task we're engaged in is trying to get my son uh, dressed in the morning. And then I notice suddenly, wait a minute, I'm not even paying attention to getting my son dressed. I'm thinking about the school district or the IEP, or I'm thinking about the argument I had last night with my husband, or I'm thinking about, you know, right, 18 other things. The one thing I'm not thinking about is, you right here, my son, and getting dressed, <laughs> right? Um, and that's a very normal human thing, right? When things get difficult, our minds start to wander and think about other stuff. Um, and so present moment training is about just practicing noticing that and not beating yourself up over it and just practice when you notice that, redirect your attention back and just really zoom in and see if there's something you can notice right now in this moment about your son while you're getting him dressed. Maybe it's the the, the feeling of the texture of, of the fabric of his clothing, you know, maybe it's a little crooked smile or a freckle or something, or maybe it's a little hair out of place or something, you know, um, really zooming in and fully being present. And, and then of course your attention wanders and you start thinking about something else and practice just non-judgmentally bringing it back. So you can think about it as kind of like analogous to driving. Like every one of us has been driving somewhere and suddenly we realize that our attention is not on the road in front of us. What do we do? We just bring our attention back to the road, right? That's critically important life and death situation. It's not life and death in our daily, small daily moments with our kids and with our, with our family, but it is really, really important. Um, And so that's just one small thing we can do is practice getting back in the present moment where our attention wanders. And you could do the headspace app and all those meditation things, but all of that comes down to, generalization, try to generalize to your daily life. Now, is that the acceptance part of ACT or is that something else? Yeah, so all, all six uh, uh, skill repertoires that we're training all work together to support each other. That particular one okay. is called the present moment awareness uh, skill okay. within the ACT literature. But here's the interesting thing is when you practice the habit of noticing what's actually showing up. And so that includes noticing your thoughts and noticing your feelings and then redirecting your attention back to whatever's really going on. When you do that, you'll notice, oh, if I'm paying attention to my feelings, sometimes I'm not super happy about those feelings. Sometimes I might notice like I'm feeling stress or I'm feeling dread or like I'm feeling hot and sweaty and like heart racing, you know. Or maybe I'm feeling despair. Maybe I'm feeling hopelessness, right? Um, And so if we do behaviors to try to make those feelings go away, they very, very often lead us away from being the best we can be in that moment in terms of what we really care about. So um, it does involve acceptance. And acceptance, just all that means is showing up for the feelings, practicing uh, 
experiencing the full range of human emotions that are a normal, healthy part of being in the situation that you're in. If you're a parent of a newly, a newly diagnosed kid, it is really normal and really healthy to feel a lot of emotions, not just one emotion. You don't have to be super mom and only feel happiness and hope. That's great to cultivate those things, but that is not human to only feel happiness and hope. When you're facing difficulty, it's critically important to um, open up to all the full range of experiences. And so on any given day, it's really normal and healthy to feel sad and to, at some other point in that day to feel hopeful and at some other point in that day to feel total despair and to even have the thoughts, I can't do it. Like it's not gonna work. What is this future gonna be like? That's all normal and healthy. And so the acceptance skill is about just opening up to experiencing those. And when you notice those show up, see if you can actually, you can practice like a physical metaphor, of like open your arms to them, like show up fully and just really notice where, where in my body do I feel um, the grief of, oh, over the diagnosis? Where does it show up? Is it in my chest? Is it a sinking feeling in my gut? And just orient your attention to it and sit with it. See how long you can uh, feel whatever feeling is genuinely showing up in the moment. It's hard. So we it's as really behavior hard. analysts, you know, we show up even from my online community, you know, there's not a lot of, I don't know. I mean, I don't feel like I'm able to, you know, I, I, it's not in my wheelhouse to give therapy. Like I've right. worked with parents who've had marital struggles and they come in and, well, he said this and uh, he doesn't understand. And, you know, and you're like, Oh, <laughs> <my wheelhouse>. um, <laughs> yeah. like I'm not, I mean, I'm married, but I'm really, I'm a behavior analyst. And maybe the book, uh, what Shamu taught me about marriage. Like, I don't know, you know, it's like, so you, so you, the professor, the professionals out there, they go into a house for a new visit and you've got all this overwhelm, stress, you know, like, okay, how can we help them without, yeah. you know, like my, my reaction is like, okay, you know, I'm going to tell you what I wanted to know about how to kind of move forward and that sort of thing. These are normal feelings, but like, I probably discount feelings more than you know, I should. And like, yeah. like, how do we really um, tackle this so that we're, well, and, we're being supportive without just wallowing in despair? It's like, okay, we, you know, we're on the clock, we got to get moving. And we, oh, right. you know, yeah. making total progress is, is also super motivating and, and good for the kid and good for the parent. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and we're kind of at a disadvantage in, in the behavior analysis field, because we don't get, get a lot of training on building rapport with parents and compassion and empathy and uh, active listening, things like that. So we got to kind of learn that stuff, most of us outside of our BCBA training programs, unfortunately. Other disciplines like social work, um, even speech and language and OT, even though speech and language and OT, they're not doing psychotherapy, but a lot of times they do get trained on how to just show up for the parent and listen, you know? Right. So a lot right. of it's Well, and I'm that. a I'm a registered nurse. So yeah, I have so a lot of training yeah. with yeah. compassion and listening and not yeah. jumping in and being like, you know... Um, and so that was really helpful. Plus I, I was a mom of a child with autism. So now it's like, I, I am really empathetic cause I, I know, cause I personally have been there, but the, then again, that's a double-edged sword too, because sure. just because I had the experience 20 years ago, that doesn't mean that I know what they're feeling. Of course. Yeah. And each person's experience is unique. Um, but for BCBAs, it's really important to remember we're always using all of these ACT uh, approaches or procedures or whatever in the service of overt behavior change that matters to the family, to the child, right? So it's never just about changing people's minds or hearts or something like that. It's not what it's about. It's about um, creating new flexible ways of talking about thoughts and feelings in the service of changing over behavior. So let me just give you an example. If a parent, if you're a BCBA and a parent says to you something like, I just feel so stressed out of my mind right now. I don't, you know, I'm just so worried about my child's future. It's hard for me to even focus on uh, with the behavior plan today, you know? Sort of a classic, if we're gonna stereotype, a classic uh, thing that really society has taught us in general and that maybe a lot of BCBAs might be guilty of is try to talk the parent out of feeling bad and try to talk the parent out of this, the negative thoughts and feelings. 
And if that works, great, go for it. But there's actually a lot of research that shows the harder you try not to feel something, the more it's there. And you're actually giving it power by trying to talk yourself out of it. And so instead of saying something like, oh, you know what? It's going to be fine. I promise. I've worked with so many kids. It's great. It's great. It's great. Don't feel stressed. Instead of that, modeling acceptance would be something like, okay, I hear you. That's got to be really, really hard to be thinking about the future and to honestly not know exactly what's going to happen. I hear you. And now uh, today, let's focus on something we can actually do today even when we don't know exactly what the future is gonna hold. So what can we do right now in this session today, today as partners um, to move towards that future that you care about for your child? Does that make sense? So rather than trying to talk out yeah. of the negative thoughts and feelings, show up for them, acknowledge them, don't wallow in them, don't go into the root cause. Well, how did you feel when you were a kid and did somebody mistreat you and blah, blah, no, we don't need all of that. We don't need it. Show up, make room for the negative thoughts and feelings and say, okay, what do we care about today? What can we do today to move towards what we really care about? What do we care about? That's values. What can we do today in one small way to move towards that? That's committed action. Does it help if we tell them that, you know, they're not alone? This is very common to feel like this. 100%. Like, does that help or hurt? 100%. That helps. Okay. 100%. And that's a big part of the acceptance repertoire, too is just uh, uh, normalization. I mean, you don't want to lie to them, but if it is very normal human emotion, yeah, you attack that. Like, look, it's really, really, really human. You know, I hope that you want to be a whole human. <laughs> and if you do, you're on the right track. It's human and normal and okay to have those thoughts right now. You don't need, so this is one of the biggest myths that society has sold all of us. And it's really, it's called mentalism. But what it comes down to is if you want to do a good job, you have to have, be right in the head or in the heart. Like you have to have thoughts and feelings that are healthy and optimistic, and then everything will be fine. And we all kind of buy into that. Even if we don't say those words, we act on that basic model, that basic assumption. And it turns out it's totally bogus. It's totally false. And we know that like all of us parents who have really struggled know that, that even when we're feeling awful, we can still show up and work really hard. And even when we're feeling great and everything, oh, we're so happy, sometimes things are terrible. So like our thoughts and feelings don't need to match. We can choose behaviors that we really care about um, in the presence of a variety of thoughts and feelings. Some of them make it easier, some of them don't, but we can still make choices that we really, really genuinely value and show up fully in the moment. Okay, so um, com commitment. And is that the same as committed action? Is yeah, that the same yeah, as goal yeah. setting or like yeah, how, is. how does that work? Yeah, okay. that's 100% ABA. That is, I mean, and ACT is not something different than ABA. ACT is an approach that was created from behavior analysis by behavior analysts based on uh, basic research on rule governed behavior, stimulus equivalence, and relational frame theory. You don't have to know all that stuff in order to be effective uh, or in order to integrate ACT into your practice as a behavior analyst, although it helps and it'll make it a lot more effective. <laughs> Um, just like, you know, understanding the theory behind anything we do makes it more effective, right? Being conceptually mm -hmm. systematic, Bear Wolf and Risley, 1968. But um, uh, now, now on my geeky uh, digression, I totally lost my train of thought. You were saying, oh, commitment. The, co the commitment part. Yeah. yeah. Commitment so and that's just action. goal setting. That's all it is. So the committed okay. action part is uh, identify what you care about. That's the values. So I care about my son's independence. Okay. And then identify uh, and then set a small behavioral goal for myself that will move me towards that. So maybe today uh, I can spend five minutes on the homework that my BCBA assigned to me. I could spend five minutes helping my son generalize what he learned in, in ABA therapy today. That's one small behavior I can do that I believe and I hope will help move me and my son towards a future of being more independent. Maybe a different value is... Um, spending uh, moments of joy with my family and my kids. And so uh, maybe your uh, goal this week or today is I'm going to turn off all the electronics, all of the, all the electronics in the house. And this is like after my child has gotten their reinforcers, got their electronics, whatever. We're not going to rip it away from them, right? But we're going to find a moment to just quiet everything down and find stillness, even if it's for five minutes before we then go back to our crazy circus life. Like just turn on some calm music, turn the lights down low, hold my child, snuggle them, you know, whatever the kid's going to love and you're going to love and just be still and quiet for five minutes. It's just one little teeny behavior. Is that going to solve everything? Absolutely not. But it moves you towards that value of finding joy and, and, and appreciating love in the moment with my kids, if that's your value. 
The values are individually chosen values. No one else can tell you what they are. And it's based on your verbal history, your learning history, and your history of conditioning. So when you go in and you know, you're a professional and you go into a parent with a new, new diagnosis and um, a child and they're overwhelmed and you say, okay, you know, you, you empathize, you say, you know, it is tough. It's very normal to feel like this. We have no, you know, even for a typically developing child, I mean, my son, my others, my typically de developing son is in med school right now. We did actually a sibling uh, interview with him before he went back uh, to New Orleans and um, that's at episode number 85. It's actually becoming one of my favorite episodes already. Um, but um, even with him, I mean, nobody has a crystal ball to see where he's going to be in five or 10 years. And, you know, nobody had a crystal ball with him when he was 18 months and Lucas was three when Lucas was diagnosed with autism. So like... But then I feel like I'm talking people out of their grief, you know, <laughs> by, you know, it's, it's that balance of, of not being too like, here's a zillion examples where, you know, not to worry, but, you know, worrying is, is so normal. So like, I want to make sure like, I'm not, you know, placating people or, or yeah. dismissing their feelings. Well, uh, you know, and, and a, a core foundational process in ACT, and by the way, in all of ABA is pragmatism. And so we do what works. And do we need to change a behavior? Well, only if it matters in some really important way. Do I care about this behavior that I'm doing as a parent? Do I need to change that? Well, is it getting in the way? of something you really care about. And if it is, great. If it isn't, don't worry about it. Work on something else, you know? So, um, so like, should you be experiencing the sense of grief and loss that you're having right now when your child is newly diagnosed? Yes, absolutely. Is it healthy to notice it and spend time actually having those experiences and maybe turn everything else off and just sit with that grief and that, and that fear? Is it healthy to do that? Absolutely. Is it possible to do that too much to where then that gets in the way of doing other things that really matter for you and your child? Absolutely, right? So it's about being pragmatic and it's about looking at and just noticing our own behaviors, non-judgmentally, but just noticing what am I spending my time on and what do I really care about that it's moving me towards? And um, if you try to turn off all the, the negative emotions, I, I guarantee you it's going to have a negative impact. You're, you're going to end up doing a bunch of other behaviors, drinking too much, whatever. We already talked about them um, that get in the way of then fully showing up for something else that really matters, like doing the hard work with your kids or getting the bills done or showing up for work or getting on the Zoom or <laughs> whatever it is. And so it's always a balance. It's not about changing how you feel. It's about getting better at experiencing however you feel and then making room for it, and then moving on to something that you can do, something tangible that you can do today. Um, every single day of our lives, when we're having the happiest day of our life, and all the way to when we're having the worst day of our life, every single day of our lives is an opportunity to choose one small behavior uh, that, makes, that fills our life with meaning and purpose on that day, in that moment, every day even at a funeral of our loved one, well, especially at a funeral of our loved one, maybe one of the worst days of our life, we have choices. First of all, did we even show up? And showing up really matters. And while we're there, do we close ourselves off or do we put our arms around the people that we love? And do we share that moment with them? Those are behaviors. Those are choices. We always have those choices every day. And they're not supposed to be easy. They're supposed to be hard. And you're not supposed to be perfect. Nobody is. You can't be. Uh, what you're supposed to do or what would be useful for you to do is work on spending more time contacting what you really care about in the moment and choosing small behaviors that'll move you towards that and treating yourself with kindness. So I, I know we want to talk a little bit about the act. It used to be acceptance and commitment therapy, and now it's also acceptance and commitment training and the difference between therapy and training. And also like, when you go into somebody overwhelmed, like at what point do you think like, this is actually clinical depression? Does it, sure. Do I need to refer out for actual counseling yeah. and, and all that stuff that kind of gets rolled into, I think, that mm -hmm. T and act. Totally. Right? Absolutely. And so, so just to recap, acceptance and commitment therapy is ACT approaches to psychotherapy. So like talk therapy. And the people that do that are licensed psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, social workers, and there's a few other disciplines. And of course, if you're in a different country or in a different culture, there's different standards, right? Um, 
anybody else doing ACT, if you're using procedures, principles, and ideally you're using uh, behavioral conceptual analyses that form the foundation of ACT to inform what you're doing, that's acceptance and commitment training. And so ABA folks fall in, in that other category. We're not doing psychotherapy and we're not treating disorders. We are um, helping people develop new skills that, that help them do behaviors, overt behaviors that are socially meaningful to them. Um, and when you think about it, that's what we've always been doing, right? Um, so uh, if you're an ABA professional working with a family with autism, will you sometimes need to refer parents out to other disciplines for help? Absolutely. Um, if, you, if you think someone's suffering from depression or especially like self-harm, anything like that, or real excessive anxiety, things like that, should you, say, should you refer out to a, a psychologist who's an expert in treating those? Yes, definitely. If you are ACT trained, does that change that? Not really, because you're not treating anxiety or depression inside of ACT informed ABA. You're still just doing what we do, right? Like what do we do in, in ABA? We help parents change their behaviors in ways that help them thrive and help their families thrive and especially help their child with an autism diagnosis thrive. Same, same exact thing. We're not treating the anxiety or depression. We're not fixing their marital discord, none of that. Um, as it turns out, when we help people uh, uh, develop healthier habits with responding to their own thoughts and feelings, they actually don't need as much psychiatric help, <laughs> which is cool, right? But, but that's also true of regular, AB, regular ABA, right? When you see your child doing better, it makes you feel better. And it, you know, so, so it doesn't really change that. We still need to be really careful about scope, scope of competence. We still need to refer out when it's necessary to refer out. What ACT does for ABA folks is just make our language more effective. <laughs> and instead of using old stuff, like just talking, trying to talk the parent into it, or maybe nagging the parent into doing what we want them to do, or maybe just hitting them over the head with research, like, well, the research says so, here's the graph, you have to do it, right? We all know how well that works. Instead of that, it helps us form new verbal habits as behavior analysts to talk about what really matters and to have those conversations, to refocus back on what works and to uh, not take our own minds so seriously and to help parents not get so stuck on their own rules, focus more on what they care about, what they can do today to move them towards that. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I had Bridget Taylor on one of the episodes, I don't know which one, and, and we talked about her research on, you know, teaching uh, behavior analysts kind of the soft, soft mm -hmm. skills mm -hmm. that are needed to, you know, pair yourself with parents and, you know, I've heard over the years where, you know, a behavior analyst or even a teacher or a, a speech therapist, you know, would be like, well, the parents just totally not compliant with it. And they, mm -hmm. they're just, you know, they're just not doing it. And, you know, and it's, I, I think it's probably because of my nursing background and my mom background, but it's like, if they're, you know, if the demand, if there's problem behaviors in this case, you know, the parent isn't, uh, a, being compliant with the behavior plan or whatever. If there's problem behaviors on the part of the parent or the child, the demands are too high and reinforcement's too low. Like Obviously, that's just yeah. the way it is. And so like, I'm very practical and just like layman's terms. And it's like, you, you need to figure out, I mean, each family, each person has a lot of history of what they've been through, what they've tried, who they've listened to before, you know, that all come into to play and just like you said, nagging or jamming it down or presenting research. It's like you're missing the whole boat. Um, the, the parent is, is not buying into whatever you're trying to sell and in, to help the child, we need to kind of unravel what, what are the family priorities exactly. and, you know, are, do they want to do, ABA, or, you know, there's also a lot of different flavors of ABA. And sure. uh, some of the flavors are, I wouldn't do them. I wouldn't mm -hmm. recommend I them. Agree. You know, um, we've had Kelsey on, on one of our first podcasts, podcast number three, and, and she was driving her child who was banging his head on hard services a hundred, a hundred times a day. She was driving him to an ABA clinic with a BCBA. They were working on colors and it, he didn't even have the ability to demand or request. She had to bring him out in the uh, community with a leash and a harness. Mm. And, you know, 
she's got another baby who ends up having autism as well. She's a single mom. Like you can't just say we're doing colors. So get over yourself. And we need to, by the way, put a helmet on this child who's two and a half years old. Like, no. And, and like, I, I hate to digress on this, but you know, you're a leader in the field. And it's like, how do we, how do we not make, you know, all ABA is not created equal. And like, we're talking about like adding act, which it sounds great. And I think I'm kind of sort of doing some of it without even yeah, really knowing what I'm doing, but you know, I need to learn more, but how do we educate people, parents and professionals on, on when to know if, if the ABA isn't really what you or I would. Yeah, that's a really, it's a tough one. It's a problem of quality for our whole field. And frankly, for the entire field of psychology too. Most psychologists that you go see end up not being that helpful. And, you know, I hate to overgeneralize, but there's a major problem with quality of training in ABA. And that's why I founded the master's program that I'm the director of is to create the highest quality uh, training possible for, for new BCBAs. And it's a big problem. And I, but the, the specific problem that you're referring to, I think, mostly comes down to function, thinking about behavior functionally. And we know that we're supposed to, but in that, in that example, they're totally missing the point. They're just picking a topography that maybe matters, colors or numbers or shapes or letters. Well, well, that's what my mentor taught kids with autism, so I'm going to do that too, right? There's just some specific topography. You know, here's a list of skills that kids with autism need to learn, and I'll just pick one and teach it rather than thinking functionally. Like, what is the function of the kid's behavior? Why is he, why is he willing to hurt himself, right? Um, like, what's going on? What does he need? And how can we help him get that through different behaviors? Um, and then also, of course, thinking about the parent's behavior functionally. Um, Shannon Penrod talks about this. Do you know her? She's an incredible autism mm -hmm. super mom. You gotta, so. you gotta get her on the show. She's amazing. What's, um, what's her last name? Penrod, P-E-N-R-O-D. She does the, uh, okay. the card, um, uh, autism live tv show that's a live uh, oh, okay. tv show yeah i've been on, oh yeah i have been on that maybe i do yeah. know her yeah so yeah she's really, yeah yeah and she yeah. says look like if you're working with a kid one of your clients right and his behavior isn't changing and you're doing the, the you know the skill acquisition plan or the behavior intervention plan and it's not working what do you do you change the plan you don't blame the child right and she said but how about with parent training when you do your parent training, right, and the parent's behavior doesn't change, what do you do? And too, too often, especially poorly trained BCBAs, blame the parent. The parent's just being non-compliant. The parent doesn't really appreciate all the work we're doing. The parent doesn't understand. The parent doesn't care. Whatever it is, or, or they go to some uh, mental health thing. Like the parent is too stressed out. They have too much depression. They have too much this, too much that. When actually, no, like our job as behavior analysts is change the environment to help the, the learner change their behavior. So if our parent training approach isn't working for a parent, that means we need to change our approach. And ACT is a way to uh, reorient parent training towards what the parents genuinely care about themselves so that they have ownership over the parent training so that it's about them. It's not about doing what the BCBA wants them to do. And that also is thinking about function of behavior. So if, a, if the main reason why the parent follows the behavior intervention plan that the BCBA recommends is to avoid the BCBA's disapproval or avoid the BCBA nagging or in extreme cases, avoid the BCBA threatening termination, right? If that's the, the reason why the parent's doing it, then they're only responding for negative reinforcement. So they're doing something that a behavior analyst believes is incredibly important for their child who they care about more than anything else in the world, but they're not doing it for the right reason. They're doing it for negative reinforcement to avoid disapproval from a behavior analyst. That's insane. So we're like teaching parents to do behaviors that really matter completely for the wrong function. <laughs> I mean, that's completely wrong headed to begin with. And so the values work in ACT is about giving the power to the parent and saying like, what do you really care about? You're not doing this stuff for me. This is your family. This is your life. Like, is there anything inside of this that really matters to you that you are not willing to live your life without that you're willing to stand for no matter what? Okay. How can we build parent training around that value? whatever your stated value is and we'll work on it together it's a completely different approach and it's and really what it is is it's positive reinforcement for the parents instead of negative reinforcement and it's verbally mediated positive reinforcement the values work is uh, the, the jargon is the augmental in the rft terminology but basically it's verbally mediated motivating operations so when we say let's do this behavior intervention plan so it'll help your child move towards a future of being independent 
and being able to advocate for himself it transforms the function i'm getting too jargony but it makes the behavior it gives the behavior intervention plan meaning and purpose whereas when we say do the behavior intervention plan it's been shown to work in research where's the meaning and purpose in there for the parent right maybe if the parent's a researcher but not really right and so it's just a different approach that helps helps make what we do on a day-to-day -day basis really matter more rather than just being do it to avoid disapproval or whatever yeah sounds great um so we covered is is there anything else that's super important about act that we should uh that we that we missed i think it's pretty yeah. straightforward the acceptance is being mindful being present mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. the co commitment is the committed action and goal setting and focusing on things you can change and maybe some really short-term goals and then training for us non-psychologists who um can incorporate these things to uh to to make everybody's life a little bit better and positive sounds like yeah absolutely um I, one thing i would like to add that we didn't touch on yet is uh the the part that empathy and compassion plays in the act model um and it's not really it's not one of the six sort of like stated pieces of the model um but it's woven into the entire thing and it's the foundation and purpose behind all of it is to make the world a better place through love and compassion i mean that's the perp that's why act was created was to uh, relieve human suffering and and help humans contact a life more full of meaning and purpose um, and in terms of human to human interaction that really the core of that is empathy and compassion and so um, you know we could spend a whole obviously a whole episode just talking about that um, but what I want to invite the, the listeners to consider this is going to be a tough one for a lot of parents is uh, is the possibility that taking care of themselves and being compassionate with themselves is just as important as taking care of their kids on the spectrum. And that, I mean, in my experience, at least, this is the hardest thing for parents to grapple with because the, the moms that I've worked with are willing to cut their own arm off if that's what it took to help <laughs> their kids, right? Liter like literally. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And so, and so what society has taught us is we can't be vulnerable. We can't uh, be weak. We have to be strong, you know, especially when it comes to taking care of our kids. And it turns out, you know, there's a good amount of research in the ACT literature and compassion literature um, that the opposite is true, actually. Like the, the less we are willing to, to be whole people within ourselves, the less we are available to show up for our kids and our family members. Um, and so uh, practicing compassion uh, with oneself is actually really, really critical and so, so important. And so I've got like a, just a couple recommendations for that if we have time. Sure. Okay. So here, uh, imagine this. Think about, for those of your listeners who are parents, um, imagine your kid maybe like 10 years from now, maybe 20. Let's fast forward 20 years from now if you're a parent of a young child. So let's, let's say maybe your, your child is in their 20s or 30s. Um, and imagine that they're facing some pretty major challenges, as we all are, right? And really actually... Um, for your listeners who are watching this, like you might even want to like pause for a second, actually start to think about this and close your eyes. And when you're ready, press play again. Um, but try to visualize your child, um, grown up, really, really struggling, trying to do their best. And imagine uh, what you would want for them in terms of them taking care of themselves. Like imagine a picture of your child in the future as an adult and their lifestyle and what you would hope for for them in terms of them taking care of themselves and them being kind to themselves and them uh, treating themselves with respect and dignity and, um, and, and spending more time on sort of like caring, nurturing behaviors with themselves as opposed to sort of destructive behaviors. If you care about that, if that matters to you in this moment, now reverse 20 years, back to right now and ask yourself, where's your child going to learn those habits from? Where's your child going to learn to take care of him or herself the way that you wish they will be able to 10 or 20 years from now? Yeah, Modeling is good. the most powerful tool we have. And I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's easy and this isn't to put guilt on parents at all. 
It's just to raise a red flag that the way that we take care of ourselves right now is teaching our children how to take care of themselves in the future when things really get tough and when it really matters. So, yeah, I think that's good. And I, I see that being um, a real stressor of parents of little children with autism who, you know, even, even parents of small children that don't have autism, you know, hiring that mommy's helper or the babysitter or asking your mom or your sister or a friend or a neighbor to watch your child for a couple of hours. Like it's, it's not only good for you because you can take a break and you can have your child get used to somebody else. It's actually good for the child because, you know, in an emergency situation or in, in, um, you know, just, just to have things generalize or mm-hmm. you might learn oh wow i didn't yeah. i didn't really realize that lucas could do that but he was with somebody else who didn't understand his little nuance <laughs> way of asking for something you know yeah. um so sometimes your child can surprise you and it, it makes you know it, it's a lot of time that your child really needs engagement And the more, you know, and you might say, well, I have no money, Mary, you know, that's good for you that you can, you know, hire a babysitter, but it's like, you be resourceful. There's, there's church volunteers, there's mommy's groups, there's, there's teenagers, there's college students who need credits or need Uh experience or, um, there's a lot, there's insurance reform now. And, you know, with some advocacy work and, um, you might be able to really get, people to help you. And so when, when I get asked, like, do you think I should, you know, have the homebound instructor come, or do you think I should get, you know, the church volunteer? I'm, I'm always like, yes, because without people now, my house yeah. has been like grand central station for two decades. I mean, there's, there's yeah. literally hundreds of people that probably have the code <laughs> to my house and just walk in like literally every day. Um, you know, but that's one extreme, but without people like Lucas would have, would do worse, but I wouldn't have been able to accomplish really much of anything without help. And so you only, your child only has one life and you want to get them to their fullest potential, but you only have one life too. And if you spend 20 years full gunning it for him to learn colors or feature function class, and you don't take your time to, you know, develop your own interests and, and life, then it it can get, it can be very depressing. Definitely. And, you know, the accessing the resources that that you're talking about are are so critical and it's worth spending the time on. And that can be sort of a longer term battle. My invitation to your listeners is you can figure out something that you can do today to be more kind to yourself today. And so if you want a real easy to do, uh, easy way to do that, is just think about someone else in a really similar situation to you. Imagine if you could step outside of your body and see yourself from the outside, or maybe your friends or buddies with another autism mom or dad who, who's in a similar situation. If you look at their life lifestyle right now, non-judgmentally, and if there was one small gift that you could give to them, that's sort of a lifestyle change, just one little teeny gift, what would it be? And then ask yourself, can you do that for yourself? So it could be something really, really small, Like if you normally stay up till one in the morning researching treatments for your kid on the internet and you're not getting enough sleep and you're just, you know, uh, haggard, maybe go to sleep at midnight, just one, one extra hour of sleep, even 30 minutes Mm -hmm. extra of sleep. Um, if, you know, if you normally are uh, getting in Facebook, uh, jousting (laughs) with people with competing views on Facebook, maybe consider setting a timer just today, just try it once on how much time I'm going to spend on social media today, grappling with other people. Maybe just decrease that. Try to decrease it by 50% so that it's still there. It's part of your life, but you give yourself uh, permission to take just a little break from sources of sort of like aversive stimulation. There I go, geeking out again, but sources of stress and distress in your life. Give yourself permission to take a small break and see if you can build a habit of that. Maybe one teeny thing. What if it's five minutes that you did per day that is only for yourself, for being kind and nurturing to yourself, um, that does not have to take away from taking care of your kid and your family. Find five minutes per day that's only for yourself, even if it's literally just sitting there with your eyes closed, paying attention to your breath, even if it's a five minute walk around the block. 
um, we can all do it. It's not, it's not a privilege to be able to take care of yourself for five minutes a, a day. It is possible, even under the most difficult circumstances. It's just hard. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I totally agree. Okay, so we are uh, need to wrap up soon. I did want to mention that um, Jonathan, as well as Thomas Z- Sabo, is that Sabo, how you Sabo, pronounce it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, and Megan Acklin Mm -hmm. uh, just published recently an article, uh, Acceptance and Commitment Training Within the Scope Practice of Applied Behavior Analysis. We will link this in the show notes as well as anything else we mentioned. Um, So we'll link that in the show notes and any other resources for, you know, parents or we didn't even get to talk to using ACT for for kids with higher language um, abilities, but maybe I can have you back on sometime in the future. But where can they learn more about ACT? Yeah, great. Uh, So I think the best thing you can do if you're a parent or if you're not, if you're a professional or if you're both, um, is to get one or two of these ACT self-help self-help books and just read them and actually do the exercises just sort of power through the cheesiness of it like oh great i saw another self-help book just do it just do the behaviors uh and and what you'll see is you'll see small changes that are awesome so the first uh the first one you should check out is called the reality slap by russ harris he's one of the world's top act trainers and he also happened to have a child with autism after he was waiting to act so uh, oh i didn't realize that yeah, and so he uses his. He own wrote experience. a book on happiness too, yeah. right? Yeah, the happiness trap. Yep, yeah. uh, and the reality slap and uh, the confidence gap. They all rhyme. Oh, <laughs> that's cheesy. cool. But uh, but but the reality slap. Check it out. The reality slap. It's a it's written okay. from the standpoint of a parent uh, parent of a child with autism, but it it walks you through all the act strategies, and it does change your life if you just practice these new mm. habits in small ways but consistently. Um, so that's uh, first stop definitely for parents. Um, and then also for anybody, uh, Steve Hayes' new book called uh, The Liberated Mind, How to Pivot Towards What Matters uh, is a bestseller on Amazon or whatever. And it's written for the general public and totally readable, totally consumable. Uh, again, if you actually just just do what the book suggests, like practice in multiple different ways on multiple occasions, you'll notice your own behavior start to change in meaningful and awesome ways. Uh, so definitely recommend that. For folks who are interested in ACT approaches for uh, kids on the spectrum, there is the AIM curriculum by Mark Dixon and Dana Palalunas, and it stands for um, Accept, Identify, Move, and it's an ABA ACT mindfulness curriculum. Um, and it's very, very consumable by parents too, not just for professionals, it's for teachers and parents. Um, and then also my wife, Courtney Tarbox, just published an article on ACT uh, for kids on the spectrum during the COVID pandemic. So some 18 really? strategies for helping kids cope with some of these crazy new reality. Um, and so that's available in the journal Behavior Analysis in Practice. Um, or you can just email her at, uh, I'm sure she won't mind me sharing her email. <laughs> but it's uh, C-Tarbox, so C T A R B as in boy, O-X, at firststepsforkids.com. And she'll send you a free copy of the PDF. And that's an important thing for parents to know and practitioners. If folks don't know it, if you want a research article and you don't have access because you're not at a university library, it's very easy to find the, the corresponding author's email address uh, for free on the journal's webpage and just click the little button that says contact or just type in the email address. Just say, hey, can I have a PDF of your article? And they will always just send you a free PDF. You don't need to buy the journal subscription or the $30 yeah. price for the individual article. Um, just, just do it. You'll feel scared sending an email to some hotshot that you've never talked to before. And that's fine. That's, that's, a, that's a good scare. Just do it. Um, and it works. They're, they're happy to share their research. That's excellent. All right. I love those. And those will all be in the show notes as well. So this has been really fascinating. Um, I definitely love talking to you and, and I might reach out to your wife to have her on the show as well. Yeah, you should. Um, so part, yeah, yeah. So part of my podcast goal is for parents and professionals to be less stressed and lead happier lives. The whole episode was all about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but just to sum up like your own personal self-care or stress reduction strategies, just two or three that, sure. that help you. Yeah. So my, my biggest one for sure is practicing that present moment attention stuff that we were talking about before. Um, And it's really just being fully present when I'm doing stuff that I really care about. 
And really for me, that's pretty simple. The stuff I care about the most is spending precious moments with my kids. And so I have five and eight year old daughters. And so my commitment to myself, and this is, yeah, it's being a good dad, but it's really self-care for me is my commitment to myself is when I'm with my daughters, I'm with my daughters and I'm not anywhere else. I'm not looking at my phone. I'm not on my laptop. I'm not doing the crazy multitasking culture that we've all somehow just not consented to and we're all a part of. That's not happening. My choice is that's a boundary. When I'm, when I'm engaged with my daughters, that's what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything else. doesn't mean I don't sometimes tell them, look, I got to work. Daddy's got to get on the laptop. This is work time right now. But when it's not work time, the laptop's closed, iPads, you know, all that stuff's gone. I'm fully there. And, and I practice doing it by zooming in and, and like I can see a freckle or a cute little eyelash and then zoom out and I can see their whole body and they're being so cute and wonderful. And you can like put them on your lap and just feel the warm, squishy awesomeness of their bodies and their clothes and their hair. Just fully tune in to the experience in the moment. Um, and if you're thinking of that as like a guilt thing, like, oh, I got to be more present so I'm not like a bad mom or something, not self-care. But if you're doing it as a gift to yourself, like what can I experience in a more profound way right now by being fully present with my kids? That's self-care. That's an act of self-care. And the cool thing is it's free. It's available to anybody at any time. You don't have to buy a book. You don't have to buy a, you know, attend a webinar or anything else. You just practice it. Well, I think that's an excellent way to end. Uh, again, thank you so much for spending some time with me and our listeners. And I'm, I'm sure that people will get a, a good deal out of this episode. So thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Mary. I really appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate what you do for the community, especially the parent community. Uh, it's really, really important work. So thank you. Thank you.